to a Dr. David Goldberg, the universe in a rear view mirror. Obviously, I got the recommendation from Hunter Motz, who's mm -hmm. uh, just really good at pulling together books that take extremely compl uh, complex ideas and then boil it down, make it user friendly. Mm -hmm. And your book, uh, I, I teach kickboxing. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a personal trainer. I train people, but I can understand a lot of a lot of principles now because you've broken it down in such a user friendly way. Was that the focus, or were you writing? Oh yeah, okay. oh yeah. I'm certainly. I was certainly never. I mean, like experts. Well, even experts, I think, need need to understand things conceptually. But um, you know, I think my underlying philosophy is. It is all well and good that we discover really interesting things about the world. Uh, we go to conferences where there's 50, 50 or 100 like-minded people, and we just talk amongst ourselves. That's mm -hmm. fine, and that's how science moves forward. But we haven't really accomplished anything if we just keep it to ourselves. And we're not really sharing it if we just, again, put out like a textbook where, you know, here are the equations, go work it out for yourself. We have to translate what it is that we've learned into something that people can actually understand. And I don't just mean, you know, here's some crazy metaphor that, that doesn't actually teach you anything. It's here, this is actually, you know, when, when, I, when I try to write, and, you know, sometimes successful, sometimes not, but my goal is almost always, this is how we really, really understand it. The only thing that's missing is the equations. This isn't just some some metaphor, you know, of, of a mountain with clouds or some, you know, something where it's you're you're just meant to sort of drift off and imagine how things might be. This is actually how we understand things to work. Um, so, like, that's my goal. And the more people I can reach like that, the better. Yes, we need a we need an educated public. Yeah. And the only way they're going to be educated is if you break it down and, and break down the barriers to the common common man believing that they could even understand it because it's a lot to unpack uh i, I think a lot uh at times maybe your brain <laughs> must be mm. just bursting from the seams well it's you know it's funny i mean it's it's more with excitement because one of the things that's cool about writing pop side books or any book actually is you start off and you sort of know i don't know 50 percent 75 percent of all the things you're going to talk about but then you really just start delving into topics they hadn't really gotten into before and it's just this wonderful opportunity to to learn about something to learn about a, a particular sub part of the the topic like much much deeper than you ever would have gotten to before that you'd ever sort of ju justified your time to, to really delve into so like i've gotten to learn I've got to learn about all sorts of topics that I never really had thought that deeply about. And so it's, it, was, it was very rewarding for me on a personal level as well. And uh, we're, we do a, an, an intro mm -hmm. outside of this, but the, could you just explain to the audience what a physicist actually does? Sure. I mean, it, it, it depends. It really depends on what sort of physicist they are. I mean, I'm, I happen to be a theorist, which means that for the most part, I get to think about ideas. I get to talk about ideas with my students. Uh, we're almost always informed by some sort of observations. And in my case, since I'm an astrophysicist, those tend to be things, images that come out, out off telescopes. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we say, you know, here's this, here's this model for in my case, I worry about things like clusters of galaxies. So these are very, very massive objects uh, with literally thousands of, of galaxies in them in some cases, and each galaxy with, with billions or even trillions of stars in them, and trying to figure out how the mass is, is, is distributed in there. And a lot of what I do is I try to figure out how we can turn those images that we get from the telescopes that are so difficult to build into maps of matter, stuff that's out there in the sky. Um, in particular, I study something called gravitational lensing. And the idea is that if you've got more distant galaxies, uh, their light gets distorted. Like if you hold a, a drinking glass up to a light, you know, it, you can see that the light gets sort of bent in particular ways. And if you, even if your glass were very clear, you could figure out the shape of the glass by looking at the shape of how, lights, uh, how the lights are distorted behind it. The same basic idea. You use what you see about these, these background galaxies to reconstruct where the mass, what's called the dark matter, uh, is in these, uh, in these clusters of galaxies. And, and basically, this is the way that we're able to see what people know as dark matter. And dark matter is this very mysterious stuff. It was, 
it's been uh, postulated for the better part of a century at this point. Uh, matter that is unlike what you and I are made of, not made up of protons and neutrons, but seems to dominate the overall mass of the universe. There seems to be about twice as much of the, or five times as much mass in dark matter as there is ordinary stuff made of atoms. So it's very, very important to really understand this. That's the sort of thing I do. Um, but, you know, physicists run the gamut. Uh, some of them build giant machines. You've got literally thousands of, uh, of physicists working, designing machines and uh, analyzing a huge, uh, huge, huge, huge data set of, of results from the Large Hadron Collider um, in Switzerland and France, for example, the thing that discovered the Higgs boson. I mean, this is not a single person uh, with sort of a desktop experiment. This is a uh, this is a giant ring that, that uh, crosses between two different countries that it's so large. Uh, so you've got – you really do have people sort of running the gamut. You've got uh, astrophysicists who go to telescopes or design telescopes in some case. Uh, other people, you know, some telescopes you can't go to because they're in space, but people who are controlling them from Earth and analyzing the data that comes down from there. You've got people who do things with basically pen and paper. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very wide range of things. And then you've also got people who, where, where what they do isn't so different than, than engineering. They're looking at new materials. They're looking at new ways to build contraptions, chips, uh, quantum computers, all sorts of sort of futuristic technology in some cases, and the first steps tend to come from uh, experimental physicists. So there's, all, there's just this it's incredibly, uh, incredibly wide range of, of things that, that being a physicist can entail. And the, the idea of uh, physics in general was to be able to somehow predict what the future was going to hold. That's, uh, that is... That is almost exactly how I put it when I when I teach my freshmen. The the I mean, it, I mean it depends on what you mean by the future. But when you talk to when you talk to people and ask them about uh, uh, ask them about what's the goal of physics, they'll say something like, "Oh, to understand the universe or to answer the why questions or something like that." But the reality is, the the actual goals of physics are much more basic than that. They're basically trying to tell us if you do A, then B will happen, right? It, it really is predicting the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you've got a really complicated model, if you've got a really, well, I should say a really accurate model, then you're going to be able to predict the future in a very, very precise way. So, yeah, I mean, that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. Okay. Well, I have millions of questions just based on your last couple statements. Uh, sure. Uh, dark matter. Okay. Is dark matter something that is say between the earth and the moon or is it is it out there and it's it's in clusters and we just can't see it or we can detect it but we don't know exactly what it is so it is between the earth and the moon and within the earth by the way whatever it is it interacts very very weakly so you know, this is this sounds really weird. Like, oh, how could it be in the Earth, or how could it be where we are, or moving through your body? But there are lots of things that we've discovered. There are these particles called neutrinos. Particles we're very certain exist. Uh, they're created in huge abundances in the sun, for example. In there's as many neutrinos uh, created in the sun as there are ordinary particles of light called photons. Mm -hmm. We see the photons, obviously. We can see the sun, uh, but neutrinos are, are a different beast entirely. Uh, neutrinos interact so weakly that literally uh, trillions of them pass through your, your thumbnail every second. And they, they do pass straight through you. The way we detect them is we build these giant underground swimming pools. And, and they're underground so that all the other stuff gets blocked out. Um, giant underground swimming pools where every day maybe three, six uh, neutrinos will hit an individual atom and create a reaction. And we're able to detect that, and we're able to actually count up the individual reactions, even though these things are just too, basically too numerous to count. I mean, there are huge numbers of them. So the idea that you might have something like neutrinos, which are definitely out there, we've seen them, uh, that pass right through the Earth, that shouldn't be that strange. There are other – there are potentially other particles. That's what dark matter may be. And for a while, people thought dark matter might be neutrinos. Seems unlikely. 
but neutrinos are definitely moving through the Earth. They're moving through us. They're moving through, you know, near the moon. They're moving uh, in the galaxy. You asked, though, and this is a great phrasing because it's exactly the right phrasing, whether it was clustered. And it is. So there's dark matter in galaxies and in clusters of galaxies, and there's a little bit more of it toward the centers of the galaxies, and there's less of it as you move further out. It doesn't clump up. I mean, the Earth is like you know, rock and Earth and so on. They get very, very compact. They get very, very high-density knots. You don't get anything like that. You can't make a big clump of dark matter. It's always more spread out than that. But because of gravity attracting uh, dark matter to itself, you do get more more dark matter at the center of the galaxy than at the uh, than at the edges. You get more dark matter at the uh, the centers of clusters of galaxies than near the edges, and we are able to sort of measure this indirectly using the the gravitational effects of galaxies orbiting or the distortions of light or so forth. So we can see it indirectly. We can't see it directly. But everything we know about it suggests that it doesn't make, you know, there's no dark matter planet, for example. Sure. Well, it's just fascinating. And even when you talk about it, my mind goes, tries <laughs> to go out deeper into space. And it it's so bizarre. Do you feel like we'll ever understand the universe completely in a million years if technology continues to well I, I hope we're around in a million years let's start let's start there right but i completely is a tough word right oftentimes I mean, there, there's been a lot of really embarrassing moments in the history of science where people have proclaimed very confidently that we're at the end of science that there's nothing else to learn and we've always been wrong mm -hmm. We certainly don't feel like we're at the end of science right now, but it was a very big deal when we discovered the Higgs boson a couple of years ago because we had this beautiful model that explained most interactions in the universe, uh, what's called the standard model of, of, of particle physics, and we had now discovered every single particle that was predicted by that model. But even within that model, there are lots of unanswered questions. We don't know why some particles have the masses that they, they do. We don't know why these particular interactions work in exactly the way they do. We don't know why the universe seems to be, this is a strange sort of phrase, left-handed. Yes. Uh, and we'll, we can maybe t return to that. Uh, we, we, we have all sorts of unanswered questions. And what's more, and even stranger, we don't know we don't know how any of this fits into gravity. So the, the, the standard model of physics describes the interaction of the nuclei of atoms, very important, of course. It, it, it uh, describes how electricity and magnetism work. All of these things, absolutely. But it doesn't describe anything about gravity, which in our everyday lives is one of the most important uh, effects we have, right? Without that, we just float off into space. So. You know, there's there's definitely some huge unanswered questions now, but our understanding has sort of progressed in such a way that we're able to answer more and more questions more and more precisely. They've tended to – every time we've done that, we've tended to sort of open up a whole new realm where there is even more unanswered questions. I mean, Newton, Newton, Isaac Newton would have been very, very impressed with everything we do right now, but he wouldn't have said, oh, well, you know, clearly it's just a couple more details and then, uh, you know, we're done. We're, in some sense, we're as far as we ever were because we, we come up with these models and then we're like, oh, this is wonderful. These models are so elegant, and yet we still don't know where the, the models ultimately come from or where the numbers in them come from. One important distinction for me, and uh, I don't want to bring you down into the uh, one-on-one level, but really for people just getting started, there is, uh, you know, classical physics, correct? Mm -hmm. And then there is quantum physics. Yep. And when we go down and things get smaller and smaller, the normal uh, gravity and, and, and other principles seem to not apply. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's about right. I mean, you know, 
So classical mechanics, I mean, most, most students take a classical mechanics class in their high school physics. And this is the sort of physics that mechanical engineers need to worry about. It's, it's the, the, the physics of holding up a bridge or firing a rocket, for that matter, or playing sports. And, and we even have an intuitive feel for how it works, right? You and I could play a game of catch um, and throw a ball. Uh, and it's going to make a parabolic arc, and your brain, even if you have never taken a physics class in your life, your brain has seen enough classical things where you can predict where the ball is going to be. You can predict the future, stand where the ball will be, and it will land in your in your glove. Right. So you've got you've got an intuition. We're we are equipped evolutionarily to really understand a lot about this, a lot about the classical world. And even as we've continued to become more and more clever and understand things about how magnets work and charges uh, running through wires and currents and so so forth, like all of that sort of fits within our, our intuitive model of the universe, which is basically the clockwork universe. Right, you start you start something moving uh, like a game of mousetrap. You set things up in a particular way, you flip a button, and everything proceeds as it's supposed to. But then you get down to the very very small, down to the scales of atoms or even smaller, and things start to look very fuzzy. And they look fuzzy not just because we don't have the resolution in our cameras to resolve, say, an electron flying around a, a, a nucleus. But they get fuzzy because the universe on those, those scales really is fuzzy. So, you know, the, the, I, I like to liken it, um, you know, there's the classic picture from, I guess, the 1950s or 1960s of an atom with, you've got an atom with three elliptical uh, uh, electron orbits sort of flying around it. And that's the way people sort of imagine atoms being where, and I think this was the nuclear, the nuclear regulatory agency or something like that used it as its logo. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it is. It's not that atoms are moving so fast that they just appear to be fuzzy to us. There's something on the scale of the very, very small that really is uncertain, that it doesn't matter how fast of a, how fast of a shutter you have, the universe just cannot make up its mind and has a truly, truly random component. And that if you try to make a measurement, of say where an electron is at some particular instant, that by taking that measurement, you really are forcing the universe to make a decision that it might not have otherwise. You don't, you don't get to decide what decision it's going to make, um, but the universe really does seem to have a great deal of, of uncertainty wired into it. And I got to tell you, you know, one of the things that's very strange, even for physicists, is it's not obvious how to understand this. It's not obvious how to understand what the human role is in all of this. And I think most physicists would say, well, there's no specifically human role, but what the effect of an observer, of, of taking a measurement is. But we do know that the universe, again, has this seemingly built-in random component, and it's, it's kind of a good thing it does, right? Because if, if, it, if there were no random component at all, you can imagine that the most natural thing in the world or the most natural thing in the universe would be to have a universe that didn't have any bumps and wiggles because a bump and a wiggle sort of would arise randomly. And so you'd end up with a universe that's the most orderly and the most non-random possible, which is one that's totally smooth. And such a universe, of course, wouldn't have interesting things in it, like human beings and computers and molecules even. So, uh, you know, the, the, there is, it, it is, there's sort of very, very different universes to imagine. Uh, but clearly, clearly they are, they are integrated at some level. Um, but one of the strange things, going back to, you know, this whole question of predicting the future as sort of the nature of physics, is it turns out, and this is a result of the early 20th century, that when, we, when I say predict the future, it actually means that in the case of quantum mechanics, you're not predicting a definite thing will happen. You're predicting a certain thing will happen a certain percentage of the time, something else will happen some other percentage of the time, and so on. Like you're making predictions that are only probabilistic, not definite. And that's, that is a very strange universe to live in, and it's one that's so confusing and so weird. You know, Einstein had this famous quote, you know, the, he, he disliked it so much, he's like, God doesn't play dice with the universe. That's a great quote. That's the first time I've heard it, actually. Um, do you? I do this mental experiment quite often. You you put yourself like in front of the Big Bang or whatever you want to call it, 
uh, that that sequence of events, and the, you you envision the universe just uh, unfolding out and 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 expanding, expanding, expanding. Uh, do you do you see it basically the same as most physicists? Do you have any opinions on uh, maybe not how it the chain reaction started, but maybe do you think this has happened? Uh, several times over. Oh, like something like the multiverse. Like, yeah, contracted, expanded. So, yeah, no, this is this is a very a very good question and one that there's a lot of debate these days in the scientific community. So, so the, just to just to remind your listeners, the, the basic picture that we have is that uh, you've got this you've got this very early universe. Um, General relativity predicts this is Einstein's theory of gravity that if you if you have a universe, it's either going to contract or it's going to expand. Mm -hmm. Like it's very hard to find something that's exactly stable because general relativity is a theory of gravity, and all things being equal, if you just put a bunch of stuff, the stuff is going to attract one another, and the universe will contract. Uh, so the only way around that is that the universe is expanding, and this was observed we, you know, by Edwin Hubble in the 1920s, and he saw that distant galaxies were moving away from us and more distant galaxies were moving away from us faster. And the idea was, oh, at one point in time, everything that is must, must, over, must have overlapped one another. There must have been a point in the past, and we call that now the Big Bang. A name, by the way, that was given uh, by uh, Fred Hoyle, who was actually making that – was, that was supposed to be an insult. It's like, what a dumb theory. Let's call it the Big Bang. So we've got this, you know, we've got this universe, we've got this picture where the universe is expanding out, and as it expands, it gets cooler and cooler, and galaxies get further and further apart from one another. And so oftentimes when, when physicists are thinking about the history of time, we think about we think about what happened at earlier and earlier times when the universe was hotter and hotter and higher and higher energies, and when we probe things in our reactors, we you know, we're basically probing the universe at, at very, very early instants. So we're able to sort of understand what happened in the first second after the Big Bang, or first millionth of a second after the Big Bang, which is more or less where we are now. But the thing is, we don't, as you rightly point out, we don't know what started off that chain of events. We don't know what happened at exactly time equals zero. Because another way of putting it is time equals zero sort of corresponds to an infinite amount of energy. So we don't know, for example, if there have been an infinite number of expansions and contractions and expansions and contractions again. We don't know. We don't know whether there are lots and lots of bubbles. So we're, we might be one bubble of the universe, and there could be another bubble of the universe that's so far away from us that we haven't, you know, the two bubbles haven't collided yet. We, there, there's lots of different models that, that people have. Part of the problem with these theories, though, is they tend to rely on uh, they tend to rely on energy scales uh, that we'll never be able to probe because we're just not going to be able to build machines that are high enough energy where we can actually say, here's where it is. And it's not like you can go back and look with a telescope and see the first quadrillionth of a second after the Big Bang, um, because. As it happens, you know, the universe was so highly energetic at that time that everything was uh, – all the atoms were, were ionized and you – basically none of the light can reach us directly. So we can't, we can't see it. We, we can't do it in a lab. So we basically have to infer it. And the question is whether we will ever really be at a point where we can sort of definitively say, yes, this is, this is the model not just of our universe but of all the possible universes that can exist. And yes, there really is – there really are other – universes, other universes in a multiverse, basically, uh, or there, there is a cyclic universe or whatever. The only thing we can say with you know, relative certainty is it looks like we understand what the fate of our universe is. So early on, people had wondered, well, the universe is expanding now, but if there's enough stuff in it, eventually the universe will re-collapse. It's like you, know, you throw a ball up into the air, and if the Earth is heavy enough, the ball will come back down. And if the Earth were very light, or you were strong enough, equivalently, the ball would go into go into space and never return if you if it had escape velocity. So for a long time, cosmologists were wondering like, is there enough stuff in the universe to make the universe recollapse again? And then if it recollapses, is it going to 
re-expand and then re-collapse and so forth. Our universe seems to not have enough stuff. Our universe seems to be light enough that not only will expand forever, but there's this mysterious stuff called dark energy that seems to make it not just expand, but accelerate. So it doesn't seem likely that in sort of the classical sense, the universe is going to expand and collapse, expand and collapse. But there are people who think, oh, well, that's actually not how it's going to play out at all. They think that, you know, we are, everything we experience in our everyday universe is basically sort of a three-dimensional surface on a much higher dimensional plane. This is a called string theory and sort of a very, very hand wavy version of it. And that every now and again, our universe and other universes might collide and that's going to cause sort of a new big bang, basically. Um, so it could be that we have, you know, periodic new big bangs. Very, I mean, a lot of it is very, very speculative because again, it seems very unlikely we'll be actually able to uh, test it in any concrete way. Do you have your mandolin so you can uh, demonstrate string theory again? <laughs> Everybody yeah. listening should watch the video uh, on 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 YouTube. It's on YouTube, right? Uh, I I don't know that I've done I don't know that I've done one on string theory. I'm not I'm not a big string string theory proponent, but did um, you explain? Didn't you uh, stroke a ukulele? Oh, ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. You saw. <laughs> Maybe it was the Higgs bows part. That, yes, yes, yes. That was a that was a different. It was a different use of a string, but it actually it, it employs the same uh, the same uh, basic idea. Yeah, no, I, I stole my my, my little daughter's uh, u- ukulele to uh, to convey the idea. It actually they're very closely related though because it's a very very uh, well used idea in physics that. Uh, vibrations in general correspond to energies, and high frequency vibrations correspond to higher energies, and low frequency correspond to lower energies. And so, when we think about weird things like, in, in that case, that was the idea of the Higgs boson giving rise to masses of particles, the basic argument goes like this, right? High mass is the same thing as high energy. and and if if you want to sort of one equation reason for why that is, it's Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. The energy of a particle is equal to its mass times the speed of light squared. So you can create mass by basically creating energy. That's the sort of shorthand version. Mm-hmm. And so what we do is we were I was strumming a little ukulele and you could almost imagine the Higgs boson sort of creating mass by putting a little capo. uh, That is, you know, when you basically uh, put a, you you, you finger all the frets, you know, and and basically all of the strings suddenly become higher frequency, which is just another way of saying, again, that all of the particles then become higher energy. And that was, I mean, but but string theory, the reason that the string theorists think about... um, think about strings in general is that they work exactly the same way. I mean, the the, the model of string theory is that all things that we think about as particles are these little tiny loops of strings, tiny, tiny beyond imagining. Like you you couldn't picture how small they are, much, much smaller than an individual atom. And the, the frequencies of the vibrations of these little tiny strings correspond to their energies and therefore their masses. So, like, it really, I mean, they are, they are related to one another. They're not totally unrelated. But as for me, I'm not a huge, huge fan of, of string theory in general, in large part because I think there's no way that we'll actually ever be able to test it. Okay. Well, this is well, – it's, it's a good – well, it's the number one reason I love your book, both the audio book and the physical book, is because you break it down and use examples that I can understand easily or, or – more easily understand, I should say. You use the ukulele. You explain the concept. Uh, whether I agree with string theory or not, I kind of have a better grasp on it. Sure. So everybody listening, please do yourself a favor. You really, the people who listen, do invest in themselves, and and it's so much fun to think about all these things. It really is. Do you find it's super enjoyable or frustrating to think about all these possibilities? Oh, I, I think it's great. I mean, I think it's great. And what's more, um, as you as you may or may not know, I, I write a column. I write a column for for Io9, uh, the the science and and, and science fiction website uh, called Ask a Physicist. And you know, one of the things that 
and people send me in questions all the time. And one of the things that people will ask me is, you know, don't you get tired of either people asking what they might think are silly questions or people trying to counter conventional wisdom or whatever. But the reality is that, first of all, I like, I like when people ask questions that sort of challenge the way I was thinking about something. So if somebody asks me a question that's never occurred to me before, like that's a really fun question to sort of delve into and try to answer. Um, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example in just a moment. One that actually I, I found a way to, to make sure that it made it into uh, the universe in the rearview mirror. But, uh, but also, you know, like, I think the thing that's, that's really interesting is that, that lay people often can come up with really interesting takes on, uh, on what it is that we know. I mean, not, not just in a sense of saying, like, oh, I have a theory about why Einstein is wrong. Those tend not to go anywhere. But somebody's saying, you know, I don't really understand why this is the case, or, you know, is this, is this one thing like this other thing? And you realize, you know, actually it is, or actually it isn't. But either way, really, it can even get the experts thinking. So the one example I wanted to give you, just because it's, like, super fun. So somebody, one of these numbers that's sort of thrown around is, that a teaspoon of a neutron star, neutron star is the, the, the dead remains of a fairly massive star after it's gone uh, red giant and, and, and had a, a supernova explosion and um, is then this very, very compact core, basically something around the size of the size of Philadelphia, uh, but has the mass of an entire star. Um, that the, the, the density of that is, is so high that if you took a teaspoon of neutron star, it would have the mass of a mountain, you know, which is one of these cool things people like to throw out. And normally, you know, when you, when you think about just throwing out numbers, like, that's cool. That's an interesting fact in and of itself. But what I love is when people take the question to the next level. And so, for example, somebody wrote in to me. They said, you know, I know that I, I, I've heard this sort of fact. You know, is that true? But more importantly, like, what would happen if you actually took a teaspoonful of neutron star? Uh, what would it do to you? And that, like, when they really started thinking about it, is an amazing question. Uh, and so all sorts of crazy things would happen. Like, you know, the only thing that keeps the neutron star so dense is the, the insane gravity on the surface of a neutron star. So, like, if you, if you were managed to pick it up, immediately it would expand to, to fill whatever container it was in. So, you know, you pull up your cargo bay and you've got a mountain's worth of material, you know, just exploding instantly. But also, you know, neutrons uh, that aren't confined like that will do all sorts of other – they'll decay in about 10 minutes or so. And when they decay, they give off really high energy uh, radiation. So you basically, you, you know, you basically take your your teaspoon of neutron star, and it creates a uh, a live, uh, basically a live nuclear device that's like going to blow up your, say, spaceship if you were imagining moving this onto your spaceship. And there's all sorts of other there's all sorts of other like weird implications to this, where you're like, you know, people throw these ideas around all the time. Like, if you could do X, then Y would happen. Then you realize, whoa, but wait a second, if you actually tried to do X. Then your spaceship, you, you, you die from like, I think I counted like five or six different ways that you would absolutely die if you tried, uh, tried this experiment. Why I, I, so this is almost like one of those little snakes that you light and it just keeps growing out type yeah. idea. Like it's just, if we take it down, the only reason why it's staying so dense is because of the, the residual gravity. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, so gravity attracts, and um, you you know, this is what holds planets together. This is what holds stars together. Um, so ordinary stars, you know, are pulled in by gravity and they're pushed out by gas pressure. So the hotter you make a gas, the more pressure it has. Just like you know, you put something near, you heat up water in your your tea kettle, and when it turns to steam, you know, it wants to open up the the top. Uh, so Gas wants to expand outwards, gravity pulls it inwards. A star is the size it is because it's the exact balance between gravity pulling in and gas pressure going out. The thing about neutron stars is that there's basically no real pressure to push them outwards. Um, they basically fall in and in and in and in and in, and gravity ends up getting strong. Gravity gets stronger the closer you are to a source. So if you get twice as close, gravity goes up by four. Um, 
And so what happens is that these things just become so compact that they, they keep collapsing until literally – all of the all of the, the 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 neutrons basically get shoved together so that if they got any closer they'd literally be one on top of another and so that's the only thing that prevents them from collapsing the thing that's cool by the way just about neutron stars if we if we're talking about that sure. is that if you put even more stuff on a neutron star if you make the gravity even stronger you can essentially make the roof collapse um you can you can basically make it so that the neutrons even though they they don't want to be right on top of one another. They eventually get so tightly packed that it, the entire thing, that gravity takes over completely, and you make what's called a black hole. And and this is, I mean, this is how we understand star-massed black holes to be created in the first place. That you start off with a neutron star, and you keep dumping stuff onto it, and eventually, uh, eventually, it can create a, a a black hole. And the black hole is so strong it's pulling in everything but we don't literally nothing can escape not even light and if we went into the black hole it would obviously destroy us but if we could live through it would that be some some type of wormhole to possibly uh we don't know we don't we don't really know but we don't think so so i mean so first off black hole black holes like a couple things about black holes. If the sun turned into a black hole tomorrow, uh, the sun, our sun's destiny is not to turn into a black hole as it happens. It's, it's too small of a star to do that. But let's say it turned into a black hole tomorrow. And all that would happen is the ton, sun turns into a black hole. Uh, at first, nothing would, we wouldn't notice anything because the light from the, uh, the sun takes eight minutes or so to reach us. And travels at a finite speed. So for eight minutes, we wouldn't notice anything happened. But then eight minutes later, we'd notice the sun blink out of existence. But as far as we're concerned, we would continue just orbiting around the little black hole at the center of the solar system. It's nothing, we wouldn't notice anything. We wouldn't fall in. Like Black holes have this bad reputation that, you know, if, if, if there's a black hole, it just eats everything in the universe. And that's not true. But supposing instead, you know, now we throw someone into a black hole. Well, we get some very, very weird effects. So first thing is, like, let's say you're falling in feet first. Because black holes are so compact, you know, it, it, just to put things in perspective, a black hole, if our sun turned into a black hole, it would basically have a radius of only three kilometers. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Right? So, but if you're falling in your feet getting closer and closer, your feet are closer to the, the black hole than your head is, say. Mm -hmm. But that means that the gravity on your feet is stronger than it is on your head. And as you get, it's called tidal effects. I mean, we see the effects of the tides from the moon uh, all the time. It moves the water, basically, uh, and sloshes things around in a particular and very predictable way. But black holes, obviously, are way more massive than the moon. And you're going to get way, way closer to them. So if you get close, if you get close enough to it, what ends up happening is your feet are pulled in so much more strongly than your than your head that you would just be stretched. It's called spaghettification, and you'd basically be stretched and pulled apart till your bones shattered, basically. So that would be very bad. Yes. But let's imagine let's imagine you could survive that. Other really weird things happen as you fall into the black hole. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but one of the things that Einstein predicted in his theory of general relativity is that time travels, time time progresses much slower in strong gravity than in deep space. On Earth, it's a very, very tiny effect, measurable, by the way, and important if you're building a, uh, a GPS device. But time travels, uh, time progresses about one part in a billionth slower one part in a billion slower on the surface of the Earth than it does in deep space. So, you know, small but measurable. Mm -hmm. Black holes, these effects become huge. So imagining if I, instead of dropping you into a black hole, if I just dangled you out right outside a black hole, right outside what's called the event horizon, the point of no return. Basically, if I dangled you there for what felt like just a few minutes to you, Hundreds of years or more could could pass in the rest of the universe, so I could sort of use this as a as a way of sort of cryo freezing you, I'd put you near the surface of the black hole, dangle you there, and then pull you back up, and behold, you're in the future. Wow. 
But then let's say I drop you below the event horizon. Now you might, I mean, except for the fact that you've probably already died, assuming you haven't died already, I drop you below the event horizon. You don't really, it's not like you see like an imaginary line uh, it, it drawn on the universe. You can't really tell that you've, you've, you've crossed the event horizon. Um, nothing, nothing alerts you to that. It's just that if you ever tried to escape from the black hole, you would, you wouldn't be able to. And not just you, like you couldn't, you couldn't escape even if you had, you know, if, even if you were made of light. If you could travel at the speed of light, even light can't escape once it drops below the event horizon. Now. People, very early on, a lot of people, a lot of scientists started thinking about the possibility that exactly as you said is, could black holes be a sort of wormhole? Mm -hmm. Could there be also white holes or something like that? So I drop something in a black hole in one place in the universe and then out it pops in another place in the universe. Now, white holes would be pretty easy to see if you think about it, right, because all sorts of stuff would keep flying out of it. I mean, probably in, that stuff would probably be in the form of light. And so they should be fairly obvious, but we don't see them. But Einstein, Einstein actually, um, Einstein started speculating about this very, very early. Uh, this was um, uh, Einstein and Rosen, I believe. And uh, they basically came up with this idea that maybe exactly like you said, you're as smart as Einstein, apparently, um, that maybe a black hole could, could serve as like a bridge across the universe. And... What people realized when they studied Einstein's solutions was mm, this sort of thing might work except for one problem. It would be unstable. If you sent even a single photon, a particle of light, through this thing, the entire thing would collapse instantly. So, like, they, 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 don't, they aren't stable. But there are people – there are people um, – uh, who uh, like Kip Thorne, who I believe is at Caltech, who have come up with other solutions, you know, that aren't quite black holes, but are try to come up with wormholes uh, that might allow you to sort of transport across the universe. But we've never observed them. We're not entirely sure that they're physically possible. In fact, the preponderance of the evidence seems to suggest that they're not. Uh, but it's good to know that you know, like serious physicists are actually thinking about the possibility of building wormholes. Uh, across the uh, across space and potentially across time as well. Well, this is it, it's funny when you uh, go into a discussion. I think of questions and then you immediately start answering the question before I asked it. So it must logically play out that way. Uh, thinking about possibilities, the reasons reason why I want a, a wormhole or, or some type of way we can't travel faster than light is is that's true. True, um, but if we could, we could. At some point, if we had the technology, we would be able to look back at the Earth and see past events. Is that correct? That is absolutely right. So uh, you could see past events. And by the way, like if you're able, if you were ever able to get a faster than light drive or send any signal at faster faster than light, then basically you're already in a position where you can you can almost almost certainly jury rig some sort of time machine, not just looking oh. into the past, but probably even traveling into the past. Um, so <laughs> it's not, it's not guaranteed. It depends on how you do it, but yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of, so for example, this idea of wormholes, one of the things people realized is that uh, if you take a wormhole, if you take two mouths of a wormhole, remember a wormhole is basically just a shortcut through space and time, uh, it's a shortcut through space. If you take one mouth of a wormhole and, and fly it around at close to the speed of light, uh, one of the other things that Einstein predicted is that if you travel close to the speed of light, just like being near the surface of a black hole, your personal clock runs slow. Um, then basically one mouth of the wormhole can be used to go in, go from the future to the past, and the other can be more boringly used to go from the past to the future. So you can turn a... A, a, a trip through space into a trip through time. So, you know, wormholes would be great, but not just for traveling through space, but also because they then become a time machine. So certainly if it could be possible, it would have already happened? Maybe. I mean, even if, even if, uh, 
even if it could already ha- even if it could happen it doesn't mean it's easy i mean the amount of energy involved would be enormous and, and the other thing to the other thing to bear in mind I and mean, this is just you know if you have to, if, if we're helping you with your sci-fi novel or something like that the other thing to bear in mind is that at least for this model of wormhole and uh, model of time machine and most models of time machines um the way it's set up is you can't ever go back before the time machine was built. You can't go back arbitrarily in history. So, so you know, even even if even if somebody's going to, be, it's not like oh, if a time machine is built in the future, then why haven't we seen time travelers? Because even if it gets built in the future, they won't. They'll only be able to visit up to the up to the moment when the the time machine was invented, not to now. Uh, so it it may be possible without having time travelers all running around. Uh, but again, I'm 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 fairly skeptical that these things. I hate to be like the, the wet blanket here, but I'm fairly skeptical that that time machines are actually possible. All right, fine. No, Sorry. But it would be fantastic to be able to look back on the Earth with a Google Maps type technology and and look at the events. Sure. Obviously, it's just a fun way to think about it. And I think my my last two questions. Sure. probably tie into each other. Um, s- the book focuses on uh, symmetry. Yep. Is there a particular... Uh, I always try to get to what is your belief, if you don't want to answer this, is fine, but in, in God or a, a designer, do you think somebody or some... This was a master plan? So, no, I'm, I'm an atheist, personally, and I think a lot of scientists are, but certainly not all. Um but one of the things, one of the things that's very interesting. So you know, we actually we've talked about a lot of sort of incidental uh, incidental issues in physics, but but haven't talked about the main issue of, of symmetry in the book. But one of the things that's very interesting is that the laws of physics, as we understand them, seem to have come to us via a very very sort of elegant, simple, and I, I'm going to use the word design, even though it's a loaded word. Design, um, and, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, Matter seems to be more or less the same as antimatter. Uh, the universe seems to not care. Uh, the laws of physics seems to be the same throughout the history of time. They don't change over time. They don't change in space. They don't seem to care. There's no absolute north in the universe. There's north on the Earth, but not in the universe itself. So there's all of these all of these rules, and they, they they seem fairly benign. You know, oh yeah, the universe is the same everywhere. There's no center. There's no edge, and so on. But like you, you put all those into play, and it turns out that if those are the laws, if, if those are the rules for the laws of the universe, they tend to produce some 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 beautiful results. The hero of of, of my book is is a mathematician by the name of Emmy Noether, and she showed, for example, that just by assuming something very simple like the laws of the universe don't change in time, you can derive things like conservation of energy, uh, a result you you learn about in your your physics uh, class or even your uh, physical science class, Uh, the fact that the laws of physics are the same everywhere in space means that there's conservation of momentum, uh, which is basically the same thing as saying objects in motion stay in motion, objects in rest stay at rest, which if it sounds familiar is basically a phrasing of Newton's first law of motion. All of these things that we sort of took as fundamental, Noether and, and symmetry laws showed, no, are in fact due to something deeper. And so there are – it is certainly the case that some very simple assumptions give rise to a very elegant uh, result. The problem is we don't know why there are certain symmetries in the universe rather than others. We don't know why uh, – we, we don't know why there are – there are various free parameters like the masses of particles and things like that. We don't know why particles have the masses that they do. We don't know – there's all these things that sort of seem to be put into place. And what's more, and, 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 and this is the thing that sort of gives rise to perhaps religious thinking sometimes, is we certainly live in a universe that is maybe not perfectly built for human life, but allows human life. Like if you switch around the numbers just a little bit, um, even in a very symmetric universe, you quickly run into to, to situations where you can't build stars or you can't have nuclear reactions, which means that you can't – you're not going to get any complex – uh, atoms, which means that you're not going to get the sort of chemistry that you need, which means you're not going to get any complex life, whether or not it corresponds to humans. 
So one of the things that physicists sometimes talk about are the idea of the anthropic principle. You know, is this a universe that's sort of special for us or useful for us? And, you know, there are sort of two types of responses to that. One is the response that I take, which is, look, you know, it may be that some of these numbers are just are really randomly generated. And there's nobody in the parts of the universe where you don't have any complex life to have a discussion about the fact that there's no complex life there. We're having this discussion because we're here. And then, of course, there are others who take sort of the other view, which is, look, you've got these, you've got this universe. Most universes wouldn't be able to support life. We're in a universe that does support life. Maybe someone is behind that. Maybe this elegance of the physical laws, maybe there's someone behind that. Um, I don't find that to be a terribly satisfying answer, but you know, I'd be lying if I said that the other side, the side that I'm on, has all of the answers at this point either. Um, I just don't know that that's the obligation of, of science. It seems that the universe likes to evolve from, you know, from elements to compounds. It, it, you know, just keeps going up the scale. It just there's like this sense that it wants to continuously evolve. Do you feel? Uh, do you feel like that's an accurate statement? Well, it certainly progresses. I mean, there's an arrow. There's an arrow of time, um, and as you know, as the universe has progressed, the arrow of time has basically taken things. Uh, it has basically created things that look fairly smooth and simple, and created things that are more complex. Uh, this is ultimately. I hate to use it. I mean, complexity is 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 not interchangeable with the word. Um, uh, entropy or disorder, but there is definitely a sense in which the universe continues to increase in, in, in entropy. That's that's the thing that defines the arrow of time, and those two things are yeah, they're very intimately related to one another. Uh, it doesn't continue indefinitely. Um, as far as it goes, like we're not we don't seem to be developing any new physics right now, and the future of the universe uh, is going to look very very grim. Um, so it's not going to keep getting – we're not going to keep getting more and more complicated structures. You know, we'll live. We'll die, I'm sorry to say. Uh, our sun will eventually die. Our, all the stars in our galaxy will eventually die. They'll eventually be conglomerated into black holes. Those black holes will eventually evaporate. And the end state of the universe, as near as we can tell, will be just this very, very, very low energy mist of – ridiculously low energy light just sitting there more or less smoothly distributed through the universe. So the fact that things have gotten more complex for a little while in our local corner of the universe is sort of a temporary state of affairs and you know it's come from the fact that we are very quickly well, not quickly, it's over billions of years, mm -hmm. but we're using up the, the energy store in the sun in order to make that happen. Uh, there will come an end to that at some point. I'm sorry to be so grim. I know, really. But, <laughs> who knows? Entropy, that chapter, I had to read twice. It, 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 can you, before we go, can you explain the concept of ent entropy and, and how that, uh, that's just the way things are being organized? Sure. Well, I mean, so entropy is one of these things. It's a technical word that people throw around a lot. Mm. Um, entropy simply is disorder. And one way of thinking about it is entropy is a way of describing how many different how many different sort of equivalent setups you can have. And let me let me explain what I mean. I mean a pool table is is, is perhaps the simplest way of, of thinking about things. So you look at a pool table. Forget about the cue ball for a second. Let's just talk about the other uh, the other fifteen balls on the uh, in the rack. You start off and they're in this beautiful triangle. Now, there really is only one way to set it up. You, you could reorder the balls, I suppose, but even so, that's a relatively small number of combinations. And so if you look at a pool table, you can say, ah, the balls are racked. But then you break the balls. You, you break the rack, and then the balls are scattered all over the table. And you could look at one table and say, oh, the balls are broken, uh, and they're, they're all scattered. Well, there's almost countless number of ways that the balls can be scattered around the table. And so another way of saying that is, you know, the, when they're in a triangle, it's a very high state of order. When they're in a, uh, when they're broken, it's a very high state of disorder. Mm. Or, you know, I've, I have some young daughters and 
for example, you know, when everything is put away, there is exactly one way where everything is put away. But there are virtually countless number of ways that the room can be a mess. And so the universe as a whole tends – it's such an important idea. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It basically says that on the whole, the universe is going to move from – or any isolated system is going to move from a state of high order to high disorder. Now, that doesn't mean that little local pockets of order can't exist. It just means that it comes at the expense of disorder elsewhere. So, you know, we are very complicated things, and a certain type of um, – a fundamentalist will say, "Well, you know, you know, you're a very high, you're a very complicated thing, uh, you're a very high state of order, and so uh, that sort of that that must disprove evolution or disprove the Big Bang theory or something." Mm-hmm. But the reality is, of course, we're not. I mean, we are we are complicated, we are highly ordered, but again, this comes at the expense of a huge amount of heat that's given off by the sun, and heat is basically another word for. For, for disorder or entropy, so you know we are we are certainly uh, we are certainly ordered beings. But the question, so the, the, the central question in my book was, and one we don't really have the answer to, is this arrow of time. We one of the crazy things is if you look at physics at the microscopic scale, if you look at the interaction of two electrons scattering off of each other, or even something more complicated, and you take a movie of it and you run it forward and you watch the inter- interaction and you say, yep, that's the thing that looks like it's according to the laws of physics. And then you watch the movie backwards. That also looks like it's, it's consistent with the laws of physics. And so as far as the laws of physics are concerned, there is no future or past. And yet, as we, as I just said, Entropy seems to increase with time. So where does that arrow of time come from is, the, is sort of the big and, quite frankly, unanswered question. Does it come from the second law of thermodynamics? In other words, um, does, does, the, uh, does the increase in entropy make time? In other words, it used to be low entropy, now it's high entropy, and the thing that's toward high entropy is what we just call the future? Mm-hmm. Or... Is it that there really is an objective arrow of time and entropy just increases with it? And the short answer is we don't know. We really – we do not have a great answer to that. There are certainly physicists and physicists I respect who, who make a very strong case for one or the other and really do believe that they – that the question is unambiguous, that the answer is unambiguous. But for my part, I, I would say that it is really an unsettled question. It sure is fun to think about. Absolutely. So uh, on that note, I, I don't want to take – I could do this literally for a, a week straight. <laughs> I feel like it would be better if uh, we can get you back on in uh, a couple I'd, of weeks. I'd, I'd, I'd love to join you again. Okay. Um, the book we'll, – we'll do an outro and an intro, and, and we're going to really do you justice on um, the YouTube video that we're going to create for this. Uh, is there anything special that you wanted to – tell people the easiest way to follow you or uh, they can follow me on Twitter uh, I, or they can follow me on Facebook and they can follow me f- Twitter at uh, ask a physicist or on Facebook at Dr. Dave Goldberg. Fantastic. This is, this is really, really an honor the book. Uh, all, all things said, not just saying because you're, I'm talking to you. It, it was absolutely fantastic. It was a fun uh, conversation. Did you read the, did you, were you the one that read the book for the audio version? No, I wanted to, but I was really, I was really quite pleased with the, um, with the, the person we got for it. Um, they, they were. I was pleased that the, um, that the, uh, the publishers let me, uh, let me help them, and, and the person we got was my first choice. So I was, um, I was really pleased about that. Uh, but no, I, I, I wanted to. But at, at my first book, I must say, we, we had. I, I, I wanted to do that one as well, and I don't think that one came out quite as good as this one. But uh, well, you could do it. Your voice is extremely great. Great, oh, voice, you. great presentation. I don't want to just flatter you, but it makes a difference. And I would, uh, I would suggest that you fight them next time. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, anyway, well, this is a great pleasure. I'm, I'm looking forward. When do you think you're gonna you're gonna put it up? This will probably be up in about two weeks because anytime you mention anything graphics will appear 
Fantastic. I was sort of, yeah, I was looking at I was looking at some of your other ones. I mean, you have a couple that are in studio, I guess, and then you have ones where you've got things scrolling along on the on the YouTube. We try to uh, get everybody in studio. It's it's impossible to bring everybody in, and uh, if we don't bring them in studio, we try to produce it the best way we can. Um, well, well, your your you know your your graphic arts are outstanding. My uh, I, I posted your little come at me bro picture. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> on my on my, my my Facebook and so my uh, my my friends and 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 fans seem to really uh, seem to really enjoy it. But uh, well, we'll, as did my wife, by the way. So uh, it, thanks for that. We'll 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 get a, a somebody to do a painting and send it to the house. <laughs> We'd love that. Thank you. All right. Well, it was great talking to you, and I, I can't wait to see how it all turns out. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Bye bye.